Um, welcome. I want to thank uh, ASIA News for uh, hosting this webinar. This is the uh, second webinar um, that I'm doing for ASIA News. And um, for those of you who uh, have not seen the first webinar, this is sort of a continuation of the first one. <clears throat> the first one was on socket grafting. It was entitled Socket Grafting, the Backbone of the Dental Implant Practice. And we covered uh, simple socket grafting. And uh, this, this webinar today will uh, expand on that a little bit and go into some more advanced uh, bone grafting procedures. Um, following up after the previous webinar. Um, in, the, in the next coming webinars, we'll also uh, tackle some more bone grafting and then get into some soft tissue grafting uh, procedures and techniques as well. Um, I am uh, Dr. Rick Ferguson. I'm a clinical assistant professor at the University of Florida. I run an implant training program called uh, Implant Educators, which we run in uh, conjunction with the University of Florida College of Dentistry, Department, Department of Continuing Education. Um, we run this course. It's a, a seven-month course um, where doctors actually get to place implants, do bone grafting procedures uh, on patients um, that we provide or they can bring themselves. It is a comprehensive training program, and uh, we're very proud to have a, this unique situation, the only one of its kind in the United States where doctors can come in on multiple weekends and do multiple multiple surgeries and um, learn all the different uh, aspects of implantology as if they were to do it in their own private practice. Um, we treatment plan all the cases as if you are going to do it in your own private practice. And these are on the slides now. You can see some of the cases that are that were done by our students in our course: um, tenting procedures, uh, sinus grafting, computer guided surgery. That's like the most uh, exciting part of our course now is that we. We teach computer-guided surgery, and uh, we're able to uh, take doctors who've never placed implants and do perfect implant placement using computer-guided surgery. As a matter of fact, and again, uh, from our previous webinar in 2012, the American Academy of Oral Maxillar Radiologists, Oral Maxillofacial Radiologists, had a position paper, and they said that three-dimensional imaging should be used for all dental implant planning. And that's what we do at our program. You can see here we are at uh, one of our planning sessions the morning of the live surgeries. Um, we have eight days of live surgeries in our course. And we're actually um, using the technology now to plan every case that we do in the course. <clears throat> so we're on the cutting edge of technology when it comes to our planning. All cases are planned, again, as if they're to be done in, in the private practice setting. Um, with, with the uh, prosthetic goal in mind. So uh, the topic today is guided bone regeneration, ridge expansion, and splitting options for the maxilla. I'm going to focus on the maxilla um, in this presentation because I think this is where these types of procedures are, are really successful. We have a saying at Implant Educators, and that is that predictability equals profitability. Um, we, we only teach procedures that we feel are predictable in the hands of uh, adequately trained practitioners. And that's what we try to do at our course. We teach people how to do these procedures so that they'll have predictability in their practice. Um, these are uh, my co-directors at the course. I'm the director of the program. Dr. Acker, Arthur Acker is our co-director. Dr. Catherine Ferguson is one of our co-directors as well. And our clinical director is Dr. Dwight Pate. Um, we brought him on this year to help out with the clinic um, and, and treatment planning and um, supervision of cases in the clinic because of his extensive background in, in restorative dentistry and implants as well. So this is the program, uh, like I said. Um, but let's go on with our bone grafting uh, presentation. Now, the key to bone grafting is um, to look at the site that you're planning to, planning to do bone grafting, the defect, um, as, we, as we like to say, as um, the number of walls <clears throat> that are present or are missing. And in the last webinar we did, um, we talked about the extraction socket. The extraction socket was a five-wall socket. And we, uh, I believe, adequately uh, talked about treatment of, of the extraction socket uh, so that later on implants can be placed into that site. Um, today we're going to talk about four-wall, uh, four two-wall, and one-wall uh, 
two and three walls and then one wall uh, defects uh, where we want to place implants. These are some of the hardest areas to treat the one wall especially, um, especially in the mandible. So I'm going to focus on the maxilla today and then uh, probably in the next webinar we'll talk about the mandible and some of the treatment options for the mandible. So our goal is to get walls. When we have walls, we have uh, sources of osteoprogenitor cells. The, the cells can grow in from the existing walls and uh, regenerate the, whatever bone graft we place into that site. And, and create bone that we can then place implants into. So if we look at a, a, a situation like this, here's a tooth that has a fenestration as well as a, as a dehiscence of the facial plate, and this would be considered a four-wall defect. We have a mesial wall, a distal wall, an apical, uh, <clears throat> apical wall, but the buccal wall is missing. And then if we look at a three-wall defect, well, maybe the, the apical wall is also missing similar type of situation, but we don't have an apical floor, a floor of the of the site, so we call this a three-wall defect. And to treat uh, three and four-wall defects, we do guided bone regeneration typically. Not very much different than the uh, extraction socket, and I'll, I'll illustrate the technique using this case. This is Nate. Nate is uh, uh, in his uh, um, 60s. He's a healthy guy. Otherwise, you can see he's had dental implant treatment in the past, but he had some teeth that needed to be extracted because of uh, failed bridge work. Over time, he developed caries under his bridges. Um, and you can see the upper right area. We had some problems there. We had to take the, we're going to have to take these teeth out. Also, tooth number 13, he has a problem there with decay, and that root has to come out as well and we need to treatment plan him in order to place implants. So if we look at a, a periapical x-ray, we can sort of visualize and, and see you know, how much bone is remaining. And the question that should pop into you know, the practitioner's mind at this point is, well, we'd like to place implants here, but are we going to need to do sinus grafts? Can you, as you can see, uh, Nate has a low sinus, and you know, we, we don't have a, a tremendous amount of vertical height of bone. Um, are we going to have to do sinus grafts here? And my my initial thought on Nate was, well, yes, we're going to do we're going to have to do sinus grafts because he's certainly got a lot of bone missing. Maybe tooth number thirteen area we can do a socket graft and place an implant there. But the other sites, well, let's see, let's see if we really truly do need to do sinus grafts. I'm not going to cover sinus grafts in this webinar maybe in a future one, but, um, you know, a lot of times I won't do a scan. A CT scan is, is, is going to give us, a cone beam scan is going to give us the, the uh, most accurate representation of the amount of remaining bone, but a lot of times I hold off on doing a cone beam scan until after we've done some cleanup work. We're going to go in here, extract these teeth, and go ahead and place some bone grafts, <clears throat> and then in a few months, we'll see what's remaining. I don't feel that these situ this situation warrants immediate placement into these sockets. There's just too much infection going on. There's not a lot of height of bone. We can't go beyond the, uh, the apices of the teeth here to get any type of initial fixation. So we're going to go ahead and take these teeth out, clean the, si the side up, and do some bone grafts. And sure enough, when we take out these teeth, what we find is an entire buccal plate is missing and some of the apical or floor of the, of the socket also. Entire buccal plate is missing here in the tooth number uh, five position. The facial plate was still present on tooth number four, but we certainly have a large defect there. And in these types of situations, and this is this is uh, number five side again, uh, in, this, in these types of situations what I like to do is what's called a dual layer technique where we place a collagen membrane after we've cleaned and thoroughly debrided the socket. We place collagen membrane first. The collagen membrane that we use is Memlock. This is available from BioRisons. It's, it's a long-term collagen membrane. It's going to stay there for about 18 weeks. And that's about how long it's going to take for osteoid to form here. And that's what I want in this situation. So we'll place a bone graft, put the collagen over top of it, get we're not getting primary closure here. And in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to place cytoplast over top of that collagen membrane. 
because the cytoplast allows us to not have to primary, primarily close the site. We can close the site having the cytoplast exposed, and it will protect the underlying membrane and bone graft, and we don't have to get primary closure. So we'll place collagen first, uh, the cytoplast will, will be placed second, and we'll close the site without getting primary closure. Here we're just using some simple interrupted sutures. This is the number two position, the number four and five positions with cytoplasts and collagen membrane underneath where we had the facial plate missing. In the previous presentation, we talked about using just cytoplasts by itself. That's in a situation where we had an intact facial or buccal plate. But here, because the facial or buccal plate is missing, we're going to use collagen first and then cytoplast over the top of it. This is what it looks like in about a week. You can see it's healing nicely. The sutures are, are dissolving. These are resorbable sutures. And in about four, four weeks later, this is what the cytoplast membrane looks like. It's starting to get pushed out a little bit. There's granulation tissue forming underneath it. And we can then take those out. And what we'll have is, is granulation tissue. And after about four months, we now have to decide what to do. Our graft should have started turning over. We get some healing, some regeneration of bone into those sites. And after about four months now, we're going to decide, well, do we need to do a sinus graft? And at this point, we get our cone bean scan. This is the Prexion scanner. That's a scanner I have in my office. And this is the one we use for all of our treatment planning. So at four, week, four, four months, we go ahead and take a scan. We're going to use our virtual implant planning software, Pyhorizons, to go ahead and plan the case. And you can see this is what we have. We're able to actually place implants into our regenerated sockets. And you can see we had full regeneration of our sockets here. This is the tooth number two position, the tooth number four position, tooth number five position. Complete regeneration of the socket. And um, with just a, a, a dual layer technique, not too much different from our socket graft technique that we talked about in the first webinar. And you can see we actually have room for our implants. The number two position, the number four position, the number five position, and also the number 13 position. I don't have the slice here, but this is the, the slice of, you know, to show that we have the width and also the height that we need for a full 3D encapsulation of that implant and bone. And we treat and plan the case, and now we're going to execute the case. So the bottom line here was through a fairly uh, straightforward, predictable procedure of socket grafting, we were able to avoid having to do a sinus graft in this situation. Uh, and of course, the patient was very happy about that. We had initially talked to, to Nate about having to do sinus grafts. And uh, he agreed. But you know, when it came down to the final treatment plan using this cone beam technology, we realized we did not have to do a sinus graft because we could put an implant in at 2, put an implant at 4, and at 5 and splint and make a bridge, a four-unit bridge on three implants and a pontic at tooth number three position. So we go ahead and now we're going to execute this. We open the site and you can see the regener regenerated bone that we have. A beautiful result there after about four months. Um, this is actually at about five months because we, we waited about another month after we did the scan um, because of scheduling issues. And this is about five months now. We placed three implants. These are Bi-Horizons uh, tapered laser lock implants with the three-in-one abutments. You can see it's nice to have these abutments on here. They come with the implants so that you can parallel the implants pretty well. And we've got lots of facial bone on all, all of these sites, including the site of uh, the number five site where we had our entire facial plate was missing. Just had a complete uh, you know, absence of bone here. We're able to regenerate that. Um, with our socket graft dual layer technique. And this is a 4.6 diameter implant, a 4.6 diameter implant here, and then this is a 3.8 diameter implant at tooth number five position. So we were able to place the implants. There they, there they are in the bone. Again, good solid bone all the way around. We had our minimum of two millimeters of bone all the way around these implants. 
And remember, that's where we started at the tooth number five position. So we were able to uh, adequately regenerate the bone there at tooth number five position and then place the implant. And these are the um, the, um, the uh, abutments, the three-in-one abutments that were prepped because we used, stock, we used those stock abutments here for the final restoration. The laboratory prepares these. We do a pickup impression of a framework that the laboratory makes on these uh, abutments. And this is the final bridge work in place, checking this, make sure that all the margins are sealed. And what's interesting about this x-ray, it looks like this implant, the tooth number, the tooth number two positions in the sinus, but it's actually not. We know that because this is this x-ray is a two-dimensional image. It's not a three-dimensional image. And we know based on our three-dimensional scan that we had adequate bone height there. Of course, the sinus dips down between the implants at the three in the number three position. And this is the final restoration that Nate uh, was delivered to him with a four-unit bridge, a pontic at tooth number three. And you can see the adequate uh, bone width of soft and hard tissue to restore this case. So that was a three or four wall defect. And because we had walls there, we were able to get bone to grow in. And we had sources of osteoprogenitor cells. And the patient's own bone grew in and, and converted that bone graft into, into uh, our final bone that we needed to integrate our implants. What about a one wall defect? one and two wall defects where we don't have a lot of bony walls. Well, in the maxilla, we have to consider that the success of, this, of the procedures we're going to talk about now really have, have to do with the density of the bone. Bone density, such as D1, the D2, D3, and D4 bone, are, it's critical to know what type of bone density you have uh, prior to doing the, the procedures we're going to talk about now, such as ridge, ridge splitting or ridge compression or ridge expansion. And it's also important to know whether you have a, enough width or an, and height of bone. And we used a, a mesh Judy classification, A, B, B minus W, C minus W, C minus H, and D. These are the, class, the, the standard classifications in implant dentistry. And we're going to talk about how we're going to treat each of these types of bone. Division A is abundant bone. Division B, barely enough bone. Division C, compromised bone. And division D, which is deficient bone. And we know that we can get um, implants to integrate. There's certainly lots of, uh, lots of uh, literature out there about different types of bone grafting procedures and their success or lack of success and the different types of bone grafts that we use in these, in these uh, situations. And what I'm recommending is in areas where we have division A or B plus bone, four to seven millimeters in, dens in diameter, and a density of D3 or D4, in the maxilla, we can do bone condensing, expansion, or bone splitting. Now, it's important to keep in mind that we need a minimum of four to seven millimeters uh, of bone width. Um, and in order to place a standard diameter implant, um, you know, we would need about eight millimeters of bone width. So in this situation, the indication is where we don't have enough bone width, uh, but it's still more than four millimeters of width. And in, in uh, subsequent uh, webinars, I'll talk about areas where we have less than four millimeters of width. But if we have four to seven millimeters of bone width, D3 or D4 density, A or B plus bone height um, in, the, uh, in the maxilla, we can do bone splitting, expansion, or condensing. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is the ridge split. The ridge split means that we're going to cut the bone, uh, making a vertical cut. Um, and move the plates apart. This is typically used for multi-teeth edential spaces. This is not something we're typically doing for um, a single tooth space. But the, the buckle plate is typically displaced buckly with a green stick or fracturing. And we're trying to maintain at least two millimeters of the facial bone. The space is maintained then either by an implant or a rigid bone graft, and the bone grows into the maintained space. 
implants are placed either simultaneously or delayed um, after bone regeneration. And if, if we do decide to delay the implant placement, we'd want to wait four to five months to place the implant. Um, as far as um, ridge, ridge splitting or spreading itself, we can do this in the maxilla, where we have, again, density of D2, D3, D4 bone. We can do this in the mandible as well, but it's not as predictable. And then certainly in my hands, it's not as predictable. And I typically don't do this procedure in the, in the mandible. But it can be done in D2 density of bone. And I have had some success, although I don't think it's, it's as predictable as if you have uh, as it, in the mandible as it is in the maxilla. And there are a number of reasons which we'll talk about. So this is the actual technique. We will first take a CT scan. We'll reflect the flap. Um, typically, we'll make a horizontal cut in the bone. And sometimes we'll need to do a vertical cut, especially if we're near teeth. We will use a, a micro saw, a piezotome, or a burr to make the horizontal cut. We'll use chisels, bone spreaders, or osteotomes to move the, the plates of bone apart, as you see in this graphic here. Move the plates of bone apart. And at this point, we can use a chisel as well. We will then place some sort of bone graft material. We can use osteotomes as well to move the bony plates apart. But because we're in D3 or D4 bone, and sometimes we can do this in D2 bone, the bone will, will move. It, will, it has some elastic properties to it, so it will actually expand and move and not break um, outright, which is uh, one of the problems with doing this procedure in the mandible. There's more of a risk of the, the plate fracturing. It's important that we try to keep two millimeters of bone width in this situation. You know, in, in the buccal plate um, so that uh, we have some, uh, some resistance from fra for fracturing. The other thing that we use to move the plates apart, and this has become more common in my practice, is we use bone expanders. And this is a kit that I use. It's a relatively uh, straightforward system where you start off with uh, a small bone expander, and you these are screw expanders. You basically screw them into the site and it will slowly move the bony plates apart. We will use this kit also for bone condensing or bone expansion. So if we look at um, a study here by Chan in 2000 and others in 2013, um, we see in the, in the Implant Dentistry Journal, October 2013, we see that they did a study. And, and, and the bottom line in the study was that uh, for screw screw expanders or screw spreaders, it's recommended that you have four and a half millimeters or more of bone. If it's less than four and a half millimeters, they're recommending guided bone regeneration. Now, I have had some success with less than four, four millimeters of bone doing um, ridge splitting. But I think my experience has been the same as what was um, published in the study, that if you get below four, four and a half or four millimeters of bone width, you're better off doing guided bone regeneration procedures, which, again, is not what I'm going to talk about today. Maybe in a future webinar we'll talk about that. So again, the technique is to do a CT scan, reflect a flap, uh, use make a horizontal cut using chisels, bone spreaders, osteotomes. It's very important that we have gentle, soft tissue manipulation. We need tension-free primary closure, and we don't want any um, temporary prosthetic on the site for at least four weeks. Uh, it's very, very important that we not uh, put any pressure on the area that will certainly lead to failure of the procedure. So let's look at Ann. Ann, uh, it, this is an older case, actually, that was done prior to using cone beam technology in my practice. And actually, before this case was done way before cone beam technology was used as, as prolifically as it is now in, in, in implant dentistry. Um, this goes back to the days when we were doing things by opening a flap and then deciding what to do. Today, that doesn't fly, and in, in certainly not in the United States, where we have uh, you know, where comb beam technology is readily available. We can certainly treatment plan cases better now. 
um, and know what we're getting into. But in Ann's case, we basically decided what we were going to do after we laid a flap. And this is what we started out with. We had, uh, she was wearing a, a temporary appliance and, and wanted to have implant dentistry done. Now, you can see the lower teeth had some problems as well. Um, after we did the upper, we went back and redid and did actually crown and bridge dentistry on the lower to open her bite and create a better occlusion. But uh, her main interest was in having these uh, this area done and uh, not having to wear removable appliance. So we opened the, opened the side up, um, full thickness flaps, and we found that we had about three millimeter thickness of bone. Um, in this situation, we did not have piezotome technology available as yet, so we used a micro saw. This is basically just a, a, a saw that fits uh, on the uh, implant motor, and we're running this at about 20,000 to 30,000 RPM with uh, water spray and we were able to make our horizontal and vertical cuts. So we made two vertical cuts, and then a very, you can see it has a very thin plate. That is one of the advantages of this type of saw, is that the blade is very, very thin, so you can actually split sites that are very, very, where bone is very, very thin to begin with. So using a lot of care, we have just made a very thin cut in this thin three millimeter ridge, and then we um, this, we were actually going to place implants simultaneously, so we went ahead and uh, created our implant sites with our um, with our plates being pushed facially. So we used uh, the uh, the osteotome to push the the split ridge facially, and then placed our implants. At this point, we placed collagen membrane between the flap and the facial bone. Um, we placed a mineralized allograft, which is a, my material of choice for bone grafting. Um, today I'm using a product from BioRizons called Mineros, um, Cortico Cancellus. I like the Cortico Cancellus mixture. And we packed that into the site, put the collagen membrane over it, and then closed it uh, primarily with uh, sutures. So again, we we have to get primary closure in these situations. Now, most of the time I'm doing this type of case where I'm doing ridge splitting or ridge expansion. Um, it's for sites where aesthetics are not so much of a huge concern. And although in this case it's an anterior case, um, the patient had a low smile line and had good keratinized tissue, so we we went ahead and did this type of situation without any sort any soft tissue grafting at this point. But uh, today we're probably doing more soft tissue grafting prior to implant placement. We left tooth number 10 to help hold a partial denture in place while the, while the bone graft was healing. And here it is healed after about uh, four or five months. And uh, we're now going to go back in and expose the implants. And one of the things we did here in this case was after we exposed the implants, we took out tooth number 10 and made the patient an immediate temporary bridge. You can see we had also placed implants back here in the number um, number 11 and 12 positions where we had adequate bone to begin with. But in the anterior where we did our ridge split, you can see we were able to expand the bone and we had bone around our implants. And we did some additional grafting at this point but we then took out tooth number 10 and placed a socket graft there as well and made a made the patient a bridge on these four implants that were now well integrated after about five months. So the patient left with a bridge, having lost one more tooth, tooth number 10, with a bridge from uh, tooth number 7 all the way to tooth number 12 on four implants. And this is how she healed. This is at uh, about uh, two weeks post-op. You can see she's healing well. The tissues are, are doing well. And then this is the uh, temporary um, at about a month out, doing well again. You can see the, the aesthetics on this didn't turn out actually to be so bad. The patient actually had good keratinized tissue to begin with. But in cases where we don't have adequate keratinized tissue, we're probably doing soft tissue grafting ahead of time. And here is the final prosthetic on our implants. You can see 
We have good bone levels on all these implants. These were actually platform switched implants. Um, this is a, a day we're actually doing a framework try and, and this is the final bridge work that was delivered to the patient. And as, we, as I said earlier, we went back and did some more crown and bridge dentistry on lower to open the patient's bite um, to uh, fix the bite problem that this patient had. So that's an extreme case where you know we we had very very thin bone, three millimeters width of bone, and in a case like that, it's it's not always possible to do a ridge split. Um, today, had I done a CT scan or a cone beam scan on that patient ahead of time, I probably would have opted for a, a guided bone regeneration procedure. But I showed that case to show, you know, the limits of how we can take some of this, these techniques, uh, the, the limits that we can take these techniques to and, and still get a decent result. Um, all else being we equal the patient, uh, you know, healing well, et cetera, no infections and such. So let's look at the next uh, evolution of the technology to do um, ridge, ridge splitting. And that's the piezotome, the piezosurgery technique. Um, this has really changed uh, implant dentistry in a lot of ways. We now use piezo, te piezo technology for doing sinus grafts we're doing extractions of teeth, difficult extractions such as ankylosed teeth, etc. But one of my favorite things to use it for is, is still to do ridge splits. Um, it's much safer. It's much uh, um, easier to get into tight spaces with the piezo surgery. If you remember that micro saw that I showed showed in a few slides before on um, Ann's case, you saw that that water spray that was coming out that. When I took that picture, the, uh, the uh, unit wasn't running, um, you know, it wasn't spinning. But you can imagine when you start spinning that, that micro saw, what happens to all that water? It gets splashed everywhere, so it gets very messy, and now you know you you get splattered in blood from that that little micro saw. But the piezo surgery, we don't have that issue. You know, the other thing is you can't see where where you're working very very well. With the piezo surgery technique, we have a, a, a spray that comes out, and you can clearly see where you're working. So it's different than traditional instruments, but the literature also shows that we get a better tissue response. So micrometric cutting action. It only cuts mineralized tissue. With the micro saw, you have to make sure that you, you don't have it on soft tissue, because it will cut soft tissue. The patient's going to feel it if, they, you know, if they're awake. And you're using this, this, these uh, instruments, you, the patient will feel it. Whereas with the piezo surgery, because there are no uh, mic, there's no macro vibrations, the patient doesn't feel it. You can get into tighter spaces, as I said, and you get a very high precision of cuts. And because of that saline solution that's cavitating around the tip, it cleans the site so you can clearly see exactly what you're doing, and it also prevents overheating of the soft tissue. So a similar case, this is Mary. Now Mary had a, a bridge that uh, was failing, as you can see here, and we decided to treat her in a similar way as to Anne. And what we did in her case was we actually took out tooth number 11. We felt that tooth was not salvageable. We kept tooth number 6 and did a post and core on it. Um, but we were trying to, we, our goal was to place implants in the number seven through 11 spot, um, and there was not enough width of bone. So after we took the bridge out and did the extraction, we, you can see here we did a simple socket graft on tooth number 11. You can see that they're probably, you know, you can't see through the tissue, but we're going to get a cone beam scan, and we can just kind of guess that there really isn't enough width of bone there to place implants. So we sent uh, Mary home with a uh, temporary appliance, and we go ahead and get a CT scan. And the CT scan showed us that we had at the thinnest place, which was in, in this position here, that's the tooth number um, number seven position, the thinnest place where we had was about 4.1 millimeter thickness of bone here. And that uh, gives us a clue as to what our treatment plan is going to be. Well, in, I feel that with four millimeters of bone, 
if we had enough enough height of bone and, and good soft tissue, we can get a good result doing a ridge split. So that's the technique I employed here. I would not probably have changed this technique uh, today. Um, I'd probably combine it with some guided bone regeneration, but that's what we did here. Again, similar to N, we laid a full thickness flap. We actually made some pilot holes prior to um, to doing the ridge split. As you'll see in a second, we used a rudimentary guide. But basically what we did was we used a piezotome to create a cut and basically connect the dots where we had our pilot holes. So you can see this is a number 10 position. This is where the implant should go. And then we're going to split that ridge across to the other implant sites using the piezotome. Because we did have some width of bone to begin with, um, we were able to get a nice clean cut using the piezotome. And these are the other two implant sites. This is tooth number 9 and then number 11. And you can see how we're able to connect the dots, so to speak, from the number um, seven position to the number nine and then across to the number 11 position. And you can see where our cut was made. Our cut was made towards the lingual, not so much towards the buccal, because we want to keep as much buccal bone as possible. The buccal bone is typically not as dense as the palatal bone. It will cleave easier than if you made the cut toward uh, and not fracture than if you made the cut towards the buccal. And we start, we did start the cleavage process trying to expand this bone outward or bow the, bow the bone outward using um, using uh, chisels here. We were not using a mallet with these chisels, just using hand pressure to push the bone facially. You can see we started that out and then we used an osteotome, again, just with hand pressure, pushing the bone facially until we were able to get the bone out wide enough to place implants. And here we place um, three implants, again, the number seven, the number nine, and the number 11 positions. And we're going to have pontics in between. Um, so we're able to place the implant simultaneously, put bone in between the sites where a bone was split open. And we'll then cover that with collagen membrane. Now, unlike the uh, socket we, sh we showed on Nate earlier in the webinar, um, we're not going to try to leave this open. We're not going to use the cytoplasm membrane here. It's not necessary because we are going to get primary closure here. The collagen membrane can be left, it cannot be left exposed to the oral environment, so we do want to get primary closure. And learning soft tissue manipulation is so important. That's one of the, the, the nice things about coming to a course like ours where you get multiple weekends of live surgery and you see multiple surgeries is that you learn soft tissue manipulation. It's so important because if you if you cannot get primary closure in this situation, the graft's going to fail. So one of the things that we um, really stress in the course of, in bone grafting is getting primary closure. We teach people how to, how to uh, manipulate the tissues so that you get a tension-free primary closure. So going along with the case here, we pack more bone in, in between the, the, the split around the implants, two pieces of collagen membrane, um, and then we manipulate the tissue so that we get tension-free primary closure. You can see where we started pre-op, and then this is post-op now, immediate post-op. You can see how we've expanded that bone outward, yet we're still able to manipulate the tissue to get primary closure. Four months later, we, we get an x-ray and we see that we have bone all the way around the implants. And we uncover and we can see that we've actually grown, we've actually grown bone into the split areas. And we've had um, a little bit of loss of bone with here um, between the number 9 and the number 11 implant. We can choose to graft more bone into there, but right around our implants, we have lots of good solid bone, a couple of millimeters to the facial, and our implants are now integrated so we can uncover the case and get primary closure again of our, of our tissue. Now, one of the problems that we sometimes run into because we did not do any soft tissue grafting ahead of time on this case is that we don't have enough keratinized tissue. 
I feel like we do need to have good keratin, thick keratinized tissue around our implants for long, long-term success. So this was a problem in this case. It would have been better probably to have grafted with soft tissue prior to doing the ridge split here. Um, but it can be done afterwards as well. So in this situation, um, we saw that uh, we did not have enough keratinized tissue and we had to do a soft tissue graft. Now, all of the cases I do like this now, we will treatment plan with soft tissue grafting. Sometimes we get lucky and we don't have to do it, but in this case, we certainly had to do it, and we have to get rid of the frenum pole here as well. Um, because of the, the uh, manipulation of the soft tissue at the first surgery, we will sometimes lose vestibular depth and we can go back with a second soft tissue surgery and restore that vestibular depth and also do soft tissue grafting. So here we did some connective tissue grafting um, using the PETA pocket technique. Again, this is something that we stress and we teach in our comprehensive implant course with, with hands-on training on this as well, um, is that soft tissue is very important around implants and we teach techniques to grow the soft tissue. And this is what the final result was after we did some connective tissue grafting just to restore the areas that were deficient after our initial surgery. When we do big flaps and aggressive surgery like ridge splits, you are going to expect some, some dehiscence and some loss of the soft tissues. So it's important to know how to recreate those soft tissues. So this is what we ended up with, three implants for a five-unit bridge you can see the bulk of bone and tissue that we have around those implants now. And we can expect that this will be a very good uh, long-term, give us very good long-term stability. Now in this case, again, this is a case where aesthetics weren't a huge concern. And uh, we, you know, we did not do a lot of soft tissue manipulation with the temporaries here. Um, the patient had a low lip line and finances were an issue. So we tried to do this as, as uh, quickly and as expediently as possible to keep the cost low for this particular patient. We did use stock apartments in this case as well. And you see we did a post and core and, and a crown on tooth number six. And this was the final bridge work in place. And that's the final smile line for this patient. Um, she was very happy with the result. Um, and, uh, you know, we were able to give her a treatment plan that fit into her budget that we felt used good techniques and we grew enough bone without compromising the amount of bone around the implants, without compromising on the type of quality of the implants and the quality of the bridge work that would give her long-term um, successful treatment. Now, I said that these the procedures we teach are predictable and one of the things that we teach is um, how, to, how to make them predictable. So this is a case that uh, um, did not go so well. This is a case where I think too many things were, tried, were, were done at one time, and it would have been better to maybe um, not do so many things at one time, maybe go ahead and stage the procedures. In this case, the doctor who treated this case did an extraction of tooth number 12 with immediate bridge split augmentation. You can see here the patient has, has a bridge and is missing tooth number 12 here with a pontic at 13. And number 12 is failing and needs to come out, needs to be extracted. So the doctor here decided to do um, extraction, immediate placement of implants with a ridge split. So the ridge split actually went very well. Um, it, we were able to, uh, actually I, I assisted in this case, we were able to go ahead and open the side up using the piezotome. We split the bone apart. We placed three implants. And you can see there's actually a defect there in the bone where the extraction was. And I think that came back to uh, sort of... Uh, give us a bad bad um, outcome on this case. So bone was placed, membranes were placed, and again, I recommend we do get primary closure because in this case we had a couple of things going against us. We did not 
have good solid bone all the way around that middle implant because there was a deficiency in the socket to begin with. The second thing was we did not get primary closure here. It was not possible to get primary closure with that socket. So again, maybe a more prudent way of treating this case would have been to take out the tooth and done a socket graft and then go back and do a ridge split later. So you can see the outcome here. It looked good immediately post-operatively, we, even though we grafted around the implants. And we used a cytoplasm membrane because we were not getting primary closure. Remember this site here where there was a deficient, uh, deficiency in the, uh, in the facial plate. This is what happened at about four months when the patient came back for their check. You can see that uh, there was some bone loss around that middle implant. That's the area where, where the tooth was, where we did not get primary closure, and where there was deficiency in the facial plate. So these procedures um, don't work every time, and you have to know which situations they will not work in. And don't try to do too many things at one time. In this case, again, it would have been probably more prudent to go ahead and um, done a socket graft on the tooth number 12 position and then going back later and done the ridge split and place the implants. Because the, the implants um, in, in front of and, and distal to the two other implants actually integrated just fine. And while the middle implant had some bone loss and had, we actually ended up taking that implant out um, and, and retreating that site like a socket graft and then putting an, another implant back in there. During the period of time when that was happening, when we were doing that secondary treatment, the patient actually had a temporary bridge on the other two implants that went across with a pond to get to, at the number 12 position. So. The patient uh, had to have some additional treatment, but um, was still able to have a prosthetic while the, uh, the case was being finished and the revision surgery was being done. Now, of course, the problem with having failures or partial failures like this is that if you don't learn how to do the case properly to begin with, and if you don't know how to do it predictably, um, the cost of doing that revision surgery is going to be borne by the practitioner, not the patient. And in this case, the implant was removed, the site was grafted, another implant was placed, had no additional charge to the patient. So um, again, learn how to do procedures properly and take a course where you're going to see multiple procedures being done. I mentioned earlier also that, uh, you know, when we have um, that the ridge split procedure can work in the mandible. But because of the poor blood supply in the mandible, uh, we have not had as good success doing the bridge split procedure in the mandible. And it's not something I would recommend today. Uh, we have better ways of, of growing bone first in the mandible. But here's Ron. Here's a case where we did attempt it in the mandible. And we have had some success in the mandible. Well, you can see what happens here with the five-day post-op. We had the dehiscence of soft tissue. And if you cannot manipulate soft tissue, if you cannot manipulate soft tissue and get primary closure and keep that soft tissue viable and have not have it necrose, um, it's not, it's not going to work. In this case, because of the poor blood supply to the posterior lingual uh, area of the mandible, you can see we had a dehiscence of soft tissue at five days post-op. And we know what the result is going to be here. The result in this situation is going to be that we're going to lose bone and we'll probably lose all those implants. And that's exactly what happened. This is a two-week post-op. This is a four-week post-op. The uh, two implants have actually uh, um, gotten loose. And the third implant was actually still, still um, solid. We decided to leave it. One of the worst things you can do in a situation like this is try to go back and do more surgery because you'll only make it worse. Um, so we're just basically waiting, and that exposed bone that you see there is going to hiss. We know this is going to happen. It's predictable. And that's what happened. At six weeks, the patient comes in, and the bone was just barely hanging on, and we were able to just pluck it out with our fingers. So you can see this bone here is, is completely um, devitalized, and it's going to hiss. It's going to come out. Uh, the, 
that that last implant, by the way, ended up having to be removed. Um, and we had to reconstruct the site there, but that's another story. So, you know, the idea again being that these procedures that I'm talking about work fairly predictable in the maxilla, not so much in the mandible. So you do have to be careful. Again, I recommend you take a course where. You know, I'm leaving a lot of things out in this in this webinar. Obviously, take a course where everything uh, is explained thoroughly, and uh, you get to see cases where predictable techniques are used. So another technique we can use in the maxilla is where we have just enough, maybe barely enough bone, but we'd like to you know to place an implant, or um, but we're just not comfortable because it's just barely enough, or maybe just maybe not quite enough. And in this situation, um, and this is a situation where we're talking about a single tooth site now, we can actually expand the bone through mechanical means. Um, the buccal plate is expanded. And again, here it's a single tooth situation. What we're talking about is ridge expansion or ridge compression. Now, whether we expand the ridge or compress the ridge is going to depend on the density that we have. If we have type 3 bone and type 4 bone, um, we can get certainly get condensing. If we have type 3 bone where we have um, a cortical plate, we're probably going to get some spreading of that bone as well. Think of it this way. If you, if you squeeze a sponge, which is more like type 4 bone or styrofoam, um, what's going to happen is it's going to get squeezed, but the volume or, or the anatomy of the bone is not going to change. Whereas if you have a dense cortical plate, like in type 4 bone, and you place an instrument into, into, this, into the middle of that bone and compress it, the buccal plate might tend to bow out. And that's what you're going to get. It's a change in the anatomy. So here's Crystal. In Crystal's case, I'm actually going to finish with Crystal's case today. Um, it's a situation where we just barely had enough bone. and she did not want to have any bone grafting procedures done um, for financial and other reasons. But we felt we could deliver her the, the result she wanted. She's a case of a congenitally missing lateral tooth number, uh, tooth number seven. And we looked at the site, and you can immediately guess that there's some missing uh, bone and soft tissue there. Um, today, I would use this implant to treat this site. This is a tapered internal 3.0 implant, a very strong implant. Um, at the time I did this, I did Crystal's case, that implant was not available, so I used a 3.8 diameter implant. Now, for a 3.8 diameter implant, I typically like to have 7 or 8 millimeter width of bone. And as you can see on Crystal's scan here, we only had 5.64 millimeters. In a situation like this, I do believe we could do bone expansion. So we treatment plan the case in our virtual implant placement software. And this is what we, what the 3D uh, rendering of it looks like. You can see the bone is getting filled in around it here. And we're able to actually fit the implant in there just barely. But we don't necessarily have our two millimeters of facial bone that we would like. So we're going to do some bone expansion. Rather than drill out the bone, we're actually going to open the side up and use just a pilot drill and then use bone spreaders. And with these bone spreaders, instead of drilling out the bone, we've only drilled with a 2.0 drill. Instead of drilling out the bone, we're going to expand the bone outward using the bone spreader. Once we're done, you can see that uh, we have our site prepared. We're able to place our implant. And um, again, going back to where we had 5.6 millimeters of bone, you can now look at the site. And this is meet, this is uh, actually about four months after we placed the implant. You can see we expanded out to about seven. So maybe not quite the, uh, the two millimeters we'd like on the facial, maybe a millimeter, a little bit more on the facial. Uh, but still, we're able to place our implant. Now, that facial plate is thin, especially at the mid-crestal area. At the, at right at the crest, it's, I'm sorry, at the, uh, at the middle of, of the implant. At the uh, crest, we do have more bone than at the middle of the implant. So 
you know, we know that the most important part is at the crest. So I'm not too concerned about that. But the problem in millimeters of width, um, and we have more width at the crest, the most important part. But the problem is that we still have this depression in the bone, which we started out with. And this depression, we can either treat that with a bone graft, or uh, and we need to treat that for long-term stability of a restoration. And in, that, in this situation, um, the patient did not want to have any bone grafting done, but was amenable to doing soft tissue grafting. So that's what we did. We did a connective tissue graft from the palate at the time of the implant uncovery. Um, and we were able to fill in that area. And you can see the difference now in the thickness from where we started um, using just a connective tissue graft at the time of implant uncovery. So one surgery, again, for the implant uncovery and a connective tissue graft. And then we go ahead and make our final restoration. And in this case, we used um, a zirconia abutment on a titanium base with a uh, Emax, IPS Emax crown. This is a crown in place. Uh, I'm sorry, the abutment in place, screwed down and torqued down properly. And then the crown is cemented over that. And this gave the patient the results she wanted without the, the depression over the facial of the implant and the uh, aesthetic result of a, a zirconia abutment with a uh, Emax crown. So a young patient um, did not do any bone grafting, but we did do some soft tissue grafting to give us the long-term um, stability of the soft tissue around the neck of that implant. Um, and that was uh, enough to adequately fulfill the patient's wishes using bone expansion rather than bone grafting and um, and drilling out and, and not drilling out the bone. So um, I just touched on a couple of the things that we uh, teach at our course. Um, this is the the, the uh, faculty at our course. Um, in the presentation, we talked about you know bone expansion, ridge splitting. We talked about soft tissue grafting. And Dr. Avi Shetrid is our periodontist who teaches soft tissue grafting at our course. All of these things are important for modern day implant dentistry, especially in the aesthetic zone. So it's, it's important that if you're going to be placing implants, that you know how to manipulate soft tissue to get primary closure. The most important thing to bone grafting today is primary closure of sites other than socket grafts, which I covered in the first webinar. Um, and I, I explained how to deal with sites where you're not going to get primary closure there. But if you're doing bone expansion, ridge splitting, if you're doing guided bone regeneration, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's important to know how to manipulate soft tissue to get tension-free primary closure. And it's important to understand the relationship of keratinized tissue especially in the aesthetic zone. And if you have a lack of keratinized tissue, you need to be able to, to get some keratinized tissue using either autographs or allografts. Use, we do use both of those different types of grafts, um, soft tissue grafting. Um, so to uh, fulfill the needs of our very demanding patients these days. Um, that's the end of the uh, webinar for now. Um, I want to again thank OsteoNews for giving me the uh, opportunity to present and share share my uh, experience and my cases uh, with with everybody. And um, if you have any questions, you have my email address there. You can check out our website as well and contact us contact us through that website at implanteducators.com. My email drfergusonatol.com. Again, I, I probably left out a lot of steps in the procedures. Um, we teach all of the procedures at our courses. And uh, again, thank you so much. Bye-bye.